What are meta-analyses and what can we learn about nutrition from them? Let's science it. Hey, welcome to Nourishable. I'm Dr. Lara. So I was kicking around on Amazon trying to find the oh-so-elusive perfect pair of leggings. Leggings for women. Okay, let's see. Buttery soft, high-waisted, Pockets. Pockets are essential. Okay, 4.5 stars. That's pretty good. Let's uh let's look at some of these reviews. Ooh, best leggings ever. Don't rise up and moves with you. They are not sheer at all, so they pass the squat test with ease. See-through leggings, so embarrassing. Awesome airport pants. This is kind of like a meta-analysis, where each review represents one study, and the average rating is the result from the meta-analysis. There could be some caveats to customer reviews, and maybe I trust some more than others, but the more reviews there are, the more I can get a general gist of the lagging quality. A meta-analysis is a study of studies. It's a way for researchers to look at a lot of different studies that have investigated the same topic and then use statistics to combine the results of all those studies to get a bigger picture of what the research as a whole is telling us. The goal is to find patterns or trends that might not be obvious when looking at just one study. To do a meta-analysis, you first identify a research question, like what is the relationship between drinking soda pop and developing type 2 diabetes? Typically, a meta-analysis will focus on just one type of study design, so it could be only prospective cohort studies or only randomized controlled trials. Then, like all good questions, you go to the internet, but specifically, you'll systematically search databases like PubMed for all the prospective studies that investigated your research question. Then you'll compile all the results from those studies and use statistics to find out what those studies say on the whole about soda pop drinking and type 2 diabetes risk. This meta-analysis was conducted by a team of researchers from the China Agricultural University. They compiled prospective cohort studies that were investigating the relationship between drinking sugary beverages and risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Remember that prospective cohort studies start with a group of healthy people at baseline, have them complete a bunch of diet surveys and health tests, and then the researchers follow them for many years and check back in about their health status. This enables researchers to gain insight about how dietary exposures may be related to risk of developing a health outcome in the future. In this study, they searched several databases for all the studies pertaining to sugar-sweetened beverages and related terms like soft drinks, diabetes, and prospective cohort. Then they filtered their hits based on their predefined inclusion criteria. Criteria like the studies had to report on sugary drink consumption at at least two intake levels. They had to report on type 2 diabetes as an outcome, and they had to start with a healthy population at baseline. This yielded 17 different studies, with over 645,000 people from nine different countries. And participants were followed for five and a half to 30 years. Yeah, that's way more data than these leggings reviews. When they compiled all these studies together, they found a 29% increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes in people reporting the highest intakes of sugary drinks compared to the lowest consumers. You can see this for yourself by looking at this graph called a forest plot, which I guess if you squint really hard and use your imagination, it kind of looks like a forest. Or maybe it's more about seeing the whole forest instead of the trees. Each row represents the results from an individual study. The x-axis is the relative risk of developing type 2 diabetes, where values greater than 1 reflect increased risk and values less than 1 represent reduced risk. And this is the line of no effect. Each black box represents the mean risk from each study, with the whiskers on either side showing the confidence interval. Longer whiskers means more uncertainty. The blue diamond at the bottom reflects the compiled risk estimate from all the studies together, with the width representing the confidence interval. It's important to understand that this summary blue diamond is not averaging the results of all the studies equally, but rather it weighs the results of some studies more than others. 
These gray boxes indicate the weight of the studies in the meta-analysis. Studies that are more precise and have smaller confidence intervals are given more weight, or more say in the final result. So if we were to take a more meta-analytic approach to these leggings reviews, then we would weigh ratings more heavily from customers who reported using the leggings for a really long time, doing lots of different activities, whereas we'd weight ratings less from people who said they just tried them on. What jumped out to me here is that not every individual study found a significantly increased risk of type 2 diabetes with sugary drinks. But when all the studies were compiled together, they showed a pretty compelling increased risk, since the entirety of this blue diamond is on the side of the no effect line. This demonstrates why it's important to not just look at one study in isolation, but rather the weight of the total evidence. You can't just take that one squat-proof reviewer at their word. I want to know how consistently the reviewers said that they're not see-through. When they looked at the data another way, they found that one additional sugary drink per day was associated with a 27% increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. This represents a dose-response relationship, where increasing the exposure level increases the risk of the outcome. Positive dose-response relationships like this support the hypothesis that sugary drinks may cause type 2 diabetes, though we can't say for sure because these were all observational studies. There are still some caveats to meta-analyses. Sometimes you may see a few meta-analyses that investigate the same research question but come to different conclusions. Often these are due to different criteria being used to select which studies to include. For example, wait, maybe one meta-analysis only included studies that had at least 10 years of follow-up data, or corrected for diet quality, or quantified for loco drinking. Including different combos of studies in a meta-analysis can yield totally different results. This is definitely a source of intense scholarly debate. Another challenge of meta-analyses is just the fact that each study may have nuanced differences, even if they were asking generally the same research question. These differences could be things like how the studies measured the exposure, what they counted as one serving, or how variable the soda drinking habits are in different populations. In my opinion, well-done meta-analyses of prospective cohort studies are the closest we can get to causational evidence in nutrition research on chronic disease. Compiling many studies together means that you can see if the impact of the exposure is consistent across many different populations. This meta-analysis included some studies with just American, mostly white male physicians, some studies with just female American nurses, plus studies of both sexes and with participants in Thailand, Singapore, Japan, and Europe, therefore increasing the diversity of populations studied so that you can make broader conclusions. Often in nutrition, we're interested in health conditions that take many years or even decades to develop, like type 2 diabetes, but also cardiovascular disease and some types of cancer. Remember that randomized controlled trials are the only studies that we can really use to make causational statements, since they're designed to reduce bias and isolate the impact of the exposure on the outcome compared to a control. However, it is generally prohibitively expensive and unrealistic to run randomized controlled trials for long enough to actually observe chronic disease development. Year 34, day 282 of test drinking. Well, do I have to? So instead, trials tend to rely on biomarkers along the disease pathway. But high cholesterol is not the same as a heart attack. Plus, when participants are being told what to do and they know that they're being watched, they may not act the way they normally would in the real world. Prospective cohort studies, on the other hand, recruit a giant group of people, but don't give them any direction on what to do. So they just live their lives as they normally would, which may be a more accurate reflection of the real world. Mm. Meta-analyses are the peak of our hierarchy of evidence. If randomized controlled trials are considered the gold standard, then that gives meta-analyses diamond status? The reason meta-analyses reign supreme is because they compile together data from many different studies that were investigating the same research question. This allows 
us to quantify a level of confidence into whether the results are consistent. Following nutrition news headlines of individual studies can induce whiplash, but train your science spidey sense to tingle in a good way when a meta-analysis pops up on your newsfeed. I mean, still read it with a critical eye and be skeptical of grand statements of causality, but well-done meta-analyses are the top of our evidence hierarchy. Based on this meta-analysis, I feel very confident in a strong relationship between drinking soda and type 2 diabetes risk. So much that I'll save my favorite root beer for those super special occasions that only occur a few times a year. That's what science tastes like. Thanks for tuning in to Nourishable. Check out the video description for links to the study if you want to dig into the details and read up on diet drink findings. Plus, check out my whole video series on the hierarchy of evidence. If you value this content, help support the channel by sponsoring Nourishable on Patreon. We'd be oh so grateful for that cup of coffee while reading studies on PubMed. Oh look, a meta-analysis demonstrating three to five cups of coffee per day is associated with reduced cardiovascular disease risk. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all things nutrition.